we should be fine now. So let me go back to my discussion. Where was I? Session three. Please, can you see my uh, slide? Yes, 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 sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, thank you very much. So as we agreed last week, we said that in the quest of formulating your equations, there are some expressions that you have to watch out for when you are trying to uh, formulate the equation. I was giving an example that if you have an amount of money to spend and agreeably you state that you are going to spend all the money on shopping, okay? It means that when you add the total cost of all the items that you will buy at the mall, it should be equal to the total amount that you have. So statement like must be, shall be, is equal to or exactly are all represented by the equality sign. Please note that. Then when we have less than or equal to, at most must not exceed, not more than available. They are also represented by the inequality sign, less than or equal to then you have greater than or equal to or at least, okay, must exceed. Or, or I also represented as what, greater than or equal to. Then you may have statements like in between. So if Y is in between X and Z, then we know that Y will be greater than or equal to X and Y will be less than or equal to what, Z. So bear in mind this. So these are some of the words we can formulate or write them mathematically in order to express the equation that we want to what, formulate. Example, number of products produced must not exceed 1,000. So that if we define X as the number of products to produce, then we know that X should be less than or equal to 1,000, must not exceed. X and Y must not exceed K. It implies that when you add X and Y, they should be either equal to K or less than K. Then we can have must be between a certain value. Then we know X is greater than or equal to 100 but S is less than or equal to what, 200. So I'm going through this with you because when we are formulating a problem using the linear programming model, these are the things that we need to be mindful of before we can find the solution to the problem at hand. Therefore, let's pick this example and we must bear in mind, let me write this carefully that in linear programming formulation, I mean, there are four main components that you need to bear in mind. Linear programming uh, formulation. We need to note, first of all, decision variables, which we've been defining already. That's the first component you have to look at. The second component, we are looking at what? Objective function. And as we said, typical of business problems, okay? Business exists, the accounting student will tell you to undertake two main objectives. The first one is to maximize profit. And the second one is to minimize cost. And lately, uh, our friends from marketing are talking about customer satisfaction, okay? You have to make sure, as part of the objectives of the firm, customers must be satisfied. We are only interested in these two main what objectives. So for any given objective function, at your level now, for any given problem, 
we are either looking at maximizing profit or minimizing cost. Please note that. So that's the second component. The third component is our resource constraints. Remember we said that there are resources that needs to be allocated to the decision variables. And here we've identified several resources in our mod uh, modeling. We talk about land, we've talked about capital, we talk about labor, we talk about um, other raw materials, we've talked about budget. There could be several raw materials that or materials or resources that we can use to, if it's a typical production firm, then the raw materials are those that we can use to uh, allocate, we allocate them for the decision variables in order for production to be undertaken. If it's a problem with uh, more of human resource management, then we are looking at how to allocate uh, manpower, that is labor, to undertake a certain task, to achieve a certain what objective function. So the constraints may come in different what form. And typical of the less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, you apply them when you are formulating the constraints. So please note that it is the constraint that goes with these guys when you are formulating. Then after you formulated your constraints, the next component is called the non-negativity constraints. Okay, in this case, the word non-negativity means that all your decision variables value cannot be negative. They are either positive or zero. This means that a decision variables value, okay, for a production sector, we are either producing some amount of items or we are not producing at all. We cannot produce negative what product. When you go to um, this guy's uh, Vortic or you go to any of the production units, they are either producing some amount of vortic water or they are not producing at all. They can't produce negative water bottle. All right. That is why we say all our decision variable, that is X1, X2 to Xn, are non-negativity. Means that they are greater than or equal to what? Zero. They are non-negativity. So these four components constitute a linear programming model. So for every typical model, you should have these four components from any given problem or a set of problems that you want to deal with. I can decide that for this week, based on my activities, okay, I want to, I have some amount of money to spend at the mall, then I have another money to spend for transportation. It all depends on how much of each of these items do I know? And if I know these items, my objective is to minimize costs. So I have to formulate a problem that represents cost minimization. So in the next slide that we are discussing, I'm picking an example. We need to identify the decision variables, that's one. Identify the objective functions. Identify the constraints. With these constraints, how are we supposed to allocate the values? Then I can conclude to say that all my decision variables are non-negative. Okay, so let's pick this problem. So a linear program is a mathematical optimization model that is made up of a linear objective function, as I indicated, and a set of what? Linear constraints. So please, let's note that. So my example one to you, my friends, if you have any question, please ask before I proceed with the example. Any question? Any question? 
David, do you have a question for the class? No, please. Okay, so I assume nobody has a question. Okay, Bernard. Bernard, please go on with your question. Sir, so please. Um, what, what was the first uh, first thing to do when formulating linear programming? You wrote something I didn't really see there. We said you define your decision variables. Define yes. your decision variables. Yes. Is that clear? Understood. Perfect. So let's pick an example and let's go on. Geopetos Wood Carbon Incorporated manufactures two types of wooden toys, soldiers and trains. A soldier toy sells for three cities and a train sells for two cities. The manufacturer of wooden soldiers and trains requires two types of skilled labor, carpentry and finishing. A soldier will require two hours of finishing labor and one hour of carpenter for labor. A train requires one hour of finishing and one hour of carpentry labor. Each week, Giopetto can obtain all the needed raw materials, but only 100 finishing hours and 80 carpentry hours. If at most 40 soldiers are bought each week and Giopetto want to maximize weekly profit, formulate a mathematical model of Giopetto's situation that can be used to maximize Giopetto's profit. So in simplifying this problem, what we need to do, my good friends, is to be able to identify the various components using linear programming model. And as I indicated, the first thing we do is to define our decision variables. So if you look at this problem in its entirety, how many decision variables can we define from this problem? Like I always do, I want you to participate in the class. So you can raise your hand, then I'll call you if you have any suggestion. What are the decision variables here? Yes, Maureen, please help us. Maureen Ofori. Hello, sir. Yes, we are all here. So we can let X1 be the number of soldier toys to produce mm -hmm. a week, and then we can let X2 be the number of train toys to produce a week. Perfect. Okay. So can somebody also tell us the, what is the objective function here? What is the objective for Geopetos wood carving? What is their objective? What are they looking for? Uh, Amwaku Peter. Yes, Peter, you can talk. The, the objective here is to maximize the weekly profits. The objective is to maximize profit. Thank you, Peter. Can we also identify the resources here? Can anyone help? What are the resources do we have here? Um, Francis. Francis. Yes, Francis, go ahead. Oh, um, if Francis is not talking, Priscilla. Priscilla. Priscilla, go on. Hello, sir. Yes. Hello. We want to know the resources. Yes, go on, please. Okay, we have skilled, skilled labor, cutting tree, skilled labor, tree and finishing. Hello, we sir, can you hear me? We have skilled labor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cutting tree and finishing. So how many types of resources do we have here? We have three. 
We have TV. Mm. Can anybody to help us? How many resources do we have? Uh, God's friend. Yeah, sir, please, we have two resources here. We have two resources. Okay, they are what and what? Sir, please, they are the number of finishing hours and then the number of property hours. Number of finishing hours for... Oh, okay, the number of what? Okay, so Prisla, thank you. Uh, Godfrey, Prisla, we have skilled labor. That is the resource we have. But skilled labor is divided into one for finishing labor and one for carpentry labor. Well, one for carpentry, okay? So, guys, I'm doing this for you because I need you to, you see, understanding the problem is the solution to itself so that you don't mumbo jumbo around to say, I don't know what I'm doing, okay? In the next discussions, I'm not going to be asking you to do this. So please pay attention. Good, so let's pick, uh, let's see how to formulate this. Since before I agree that for LP, linear programming formulation, we need to define the decision variable. So the first component says we should define uh, decision variables, okay? And somebody says that let x1 represent, x1 should represent the quantity or number of uh, soldier toys, okay, to produce or to make. Let x2 represent number of what? Uh, train toys, soldier toys, train toys to also produce. We have defined a decision variable. The second thing to do is that we have to define our objective what? Function. And please note that this problem is a maximization of what? Profit. So if it is a maximization, or we represent it as what? Maximize Z. Z represent the profit. So we need to find out to ask from the problem, what are the components that represent what? The unit profit or the unit selling price. Because we need to know the total profit. And your basic economics will tell you that the total profit is a unit profit times what? Quantity. So if I take decision variable for soldier toys, what is the unit selling price for soldier toys? From the problem, we are told that a soldier toy will be sold for three what? Cities. So the total profit for soldier toys will be three times my X1 plus the, again, what is the total profit for what? Trade toys. We are told a unit selling price for trade toys also what? Two. So this is also two times what? X what? Two. This expression here represents my objective function. And because the problem talks about sales, unit price, selling, unit price, that is the assumption that my objective function is a maximization problem. Then the third thing we say that we need to define or formulate our what? Constraints. And we have constraint for labor, which is divided into two, carpentry and what? Finishing. So I can decide that, let me formulate the whole constraint for what? Finishing. So let me write here finishing. Okay. And I'm told that we are, we have, we can obtain all the major raw materials, but only 100 finishing labor. And this finishing labor, a soldier toy will require two hours. And a train toy will also require one hour. So I have to say that two hours times my soldier toys, which is 2x1 plus x2, 
the statement is but only means that my expression but only we cannot exceed the amount we've been given but we can utilize either or or less of the amount so this will be less than or equal to 100 hours we do the same for carpentry we are also told that we have 80 carpentry hours and from that, we are allocating one hour for happiness and one hour for also what? Finishing for children toys and playing toys respectively. So I have X1 plus X2 less than or equal to 80 hours. These are the constraints for the resources. But if you look at the question again, you are told that if at most 40 soldiers are bought each week, at most 40 soldier toys will be bought, at most. So let me name this constraint as demand, okay? We are told that at most 40 soldier toys will be bought. It means that for X1, at most, we have agreed that at most is what? less than or equal to what 40 toys this is the third component which is the constraint then the last one is a non-negativity constraint and non-negativity says that all our decision variables can be non-negative means that x1 is greater than or equal to zero. X2 is also greater than or equal to zero. Or you can say X1, X2 are both greater than or equal to what? Zero. Means that we either produce some quantities of toys for soldiers and train, or we produce nothing at all. What we have done here is to formulate or to do linear programming formulation. Thank you very much. If you have any question, please ask me before we, uh, I should slow down. Wow, it means that I'm going fast. Sir, please, we can see the, can we see the question again? Okay. Uh, Francis, the graft and Dorcas. So let's start with Dorcas. Yes, Dorcas. Ask your question, Dorcas. Sir. Yes. The network went off when you got finishing. So can you start from there? Uh, okay, the graphs. Lucas, I've heard you. Mute yourself. The graphs. Okay. Sir, so please, I wanted to ask you about the objective function. Mm -hmm. You said we are to maximize profit. That is Z. So Z is representing profit, right? Profit, yes. Yeah. But what I know about profit is, uh, is it the selling price minus the cost price? But here yes. it seems like we only uh, multiply it. My, uh -huh. my friend, basic, basic profit, basic profit is what? We are maximizing profit. We don't have okay. cost in this concern. If you don't have cost, what happens to your profit? Is it not unit price times selling, uh, unit times quantity, uh, unit price times quantity? Um, yes, yes, sure. Okay, thank you very much. Francis, yes, Francis. I want to see the question again. I will show you the question. Relax. Um, Sir, please, where did you get the 180 hour of finishing? So, my friends, this is the question. Let's read the question again. Oh, it's, it's not 180, it's 80. So, I wrote 180, right? Uh, where is it? This is 100, not 180. Okay, so you want to see the question again. This is the question. Tell me where the challenge is. Any challenge? Um, any challenge so far? If you're, yes, Dockers. 
Docas, is it the same question? I'll come to your matter. Don't worry. Do you have another question? Yes, Abraham. Okay, so please. Um, I can't hear you. Mm -hmm. Yes, go on. Yes, go on. Yeah, go on. yeah, please, I'm asking. Um, that, that Does it mean that from this question, we are assuming the selling price for each unit is the profit you are making from selling that unit? Because I'm seeing a soldier sells for, I mean, three three cities, and then a train sells for two cities, and that is what we use to get a, I mean, the maximization function. Yes, it is either a unit profit or a selling price for a particular product, and the assumption we have here is that based on the problem, this is a maximization problem. And if it's a maximization and want to calculate the profit, then we are looking for the component of profit. And components of profit, we are looking at what? Unit price or unit profit or unit selling price times the quantity will give me the profit for that particular item. Here, we don't have cost item here. I hope that is uh, clear. All right. So... Uh, somebody said I should go over finishing. Look, we said the constraints. Finishing hours were giving us 100. Carpentry hours was also giving us what? 180 hours. We are told that out of the 100, a soldier will require two hours of finishing labor. And a train will require one hour of finishing labor two hours of finishing labor for soldier, one hour for what? Train. If I want to know the total hours, as long as utilization is concerned, I'm looking at total hours for finishing plus total hours for soldier, sorry, and total hours for what? Finishing. Will either be less than or equal to the 100 hours allocated. Same to carpentry. We are told we have back only 80 carpentry hours. If we do, we require one hour for finishing, one hour for soldier toys under carpentry, and one hour for what? Train toys under carpentry. So X1 plus X2 should give me my 80 hours, less than or equal to, but only, that was the statement, but only. Then demand constraint is not a resource, but it's part of the constraints that we need to formulate. And we are told that if at most 40 soldiers' toys are bought each week, at most, so at any given point in time, demand for soldier toys should be either 40 or less than what? 40. Then we come to the non-negativity constraints to say that X1 is greater than or equal to zero. X2 is also greater than or equal to what? Zero. I hope this makes the explanation more clearly. We have no because you can have three or more decision variables. We said we can represent the decision variable by X and Y anymore. We are using X1, X2, X3 to represent them. So let's proceed with the question. So in summary, this is what you see on this table. You see resources, finishing a carpentry, then resource per unit, okay? Soldier requires two hours of finishing, one hour of labor. Total available hours for finishing is 100. Then for carpentry, you have one hour usage for soldier and two hour, one hour again usage for train toys, we have total of 80 available hours. Then we are told per unit profit for soldier is $3. Train is also what? 
$2. With this, we can go further to formulate, uh, as we have done, decision variable component two, the objective function, component three, the resource constraints and the other constraint. Then the component four, we look at the non-negativity constraints. All decision variables should be non-negative as we have represented here. So in all, this becomes, uh, by defining the objective function, this become a linear program solution for the problem at hand. Uh, is that clear now? So I can go forward. Is it clear? This is a maximization problem. Please note that. That's why we say maximize Z. If it is a minimization, I'll write this as what? Minimize Z. In this case, you'll be given an, an indication that the problem at hand, you are dealing with what? Cost and not what? Profit. That's why I'm saying that at your level, we will stick to either a minimization problem or maximization problem. But as you move along, we can have minimization and maximization together. So let's see that if you are solving problems, note that we are sticking with either maximizing or minimizing a decision variable. Then we say that, how do we solve for X1 and what X2? And last week or this Monday, we agreed when you have two decision variables, you can use the graphical approach to solve the problem. Or better still, we can say that let's use matrix to solve for X1 and X2. But today I'm focusing on how to use graphical approach to solve for our unknown variables, i.e. X1 and what? X2. So last Monday again, we're talking about feasible region. Remember I said that when you plot the graph, where the lines intersect, we are looking for the common region. The common region to all the points that you identify is what we call the feasible region. So the feasible region for an LP is a set of all points that satisfies all the LP's constraints and science restriction. Then for maximization problem, we are looking for the optimal solution. We are looking for the point in the feasible region with the largest objective function value. I'll be explaining this further. Then for minimization problem, our optimal solution is again the point in the feasible region with the smallest objective what function. So by way of plotting this whole problem here, like I said, I need coordinates in order to plot the graph. And these will be the lines that I'm interested in, the constraints lines. Okay, therefore, if I assume that X1 is zero here, X2 will be what? 100 for this equation. Then if X2 is also zero, X1 will be what? 50, so I have 50, zero. I can plot my straight line with this. Then for second equation, if X1 is zero, X2 is 80. Then if X2 is also zero, x1 is what 80 by substitution i can also go further to plot the graph so that is what you see here sorry then the last one x1 will be equal to what 40 that is the guy here so x1 is 40 x2 is zero so that's not a big deal so this is what we have plotted this line is what we say x1 equals to what 40 means that x2 is zero so that is a straight line but remember the constraint says that this is what less than or what equal to and i remember telling you that when we are drawing the less than or equal to 
we are concerned for less than we are looking at the region or the lines that are on the straight line or below the straight line. I hope you remember that. Then this other line, so I draw it here. So technically, this one goes all the way to this point for this line, straight line. That is the feasible region for just this line. Then the next line is this. Let me call this one. If I draw this, it also says less than or equal to, which is the other constraint, means that it is also this guy here all the way down here. Then the third one also says less than or equal to. So when I draw, I'm looking at from here, this guy here, this guy, let me use this line on this line. So at any given point in time, you are drawing a line from the equation. You have to know the inequality sign that represents that equation because we are interested in the feasible solution. Now watch here. With those three lines, there is a region that is common to all of them. And that is this region. We have one let me change my uh color let me use this guy here common region is this side to this side that side and this side all the way up here okay so this portion satisfy as we said earlier satisfy the region that we are looking for that is the optic the feasible solution area so if you plot a graph and i ask you to identify the feasible solution area you are looking at the region that is common to all the lines that you have what drawn then there are points of intersection in the feasible solution area this is one of them this is one of them this is one of them this is one and that is one. So we have five points within the feasible solution area. And as I said, if we are handling maximization problem, we are interested in one of the points that give us the highest objective function value. So if I stand here, I know that I can identify this as what? X1 is zero, X2 is 80 here so let me name here a then b this is i guess 60 and um 60 and 20 here exactly 60 and 20 so if x1 is 20 from this point that's a this is b x2 is what 60 that is one of the points then let's name here c we are here we know x1 is 40 x2 will be exactly 20 by way of graphing so 40 and 20 this is c d this is another point of interest x1 is what 40 x2 is zero then the last one how many do i have here one two three four okay then the last point which is this one, maybe let me call it a D or E, means that X1 is zero, X2 is also zero. So these are the feasible points that can give me the solution. But for maximization, as I said, we are looking for one of them. So what some people can do, I mean, uh, a smart way is to substitute each of these points into the objective function. Remember, our objective function was, um, what is the guy? This is our objective function, okay? So what somebody can do is to substitute each of the point into the objective function and calculate the value. So you may end up calculating five different objective function value. And because we are dealing with maximization, you select the one that gives you the highest what profit where where we here so one of these either you choose 
Two x times zero plus eighty times eighty. What? Or the next one, you introduce the next one. This is our objective function. Okay. So three. Who is that? Oh, guys. Come on. So by way of substitution, if this is point A, it is three times zero plus what? Two times 80, I'll put the profit down, which is calculated here as 160. Okay, the next one, 40 times three plus two times zero, give me 120. The next one is 20 times three, 40, three times 40 plus two times 20, give you 160. The next point is 2060. 3 times 20 plus 2 times 60 will give you what? 180. And because we said we are looking at maximization, the point with the highest objective function value, which is what? 20, 20 and 60. 20 and 60. That is point from here. We said point B or from the example you see J. J is the optimal, optimal solution. Okay, so that is what you can do. But alternatively, we can also introduce another way of finding the one with the, or the one that gives us the highest profit. So we introduce what we call the ISO profit line. You can see dotted lines within the graph. Okay, the assumption is that if I pick this my profit function 2x2, okay. I want to assume some, based on the coordinates and the lines I have here, if I'm introducing the ISO profit line, I can have thousands of profit lines by assuming if profit is 100, what to be X1, what to be X2. So here I plot a graph by finding the coordinates, or if profit is 120, what to be X1, X2. So the dotted lines you see are called the ISO profit line. And one of this line for maximization problem, we are looking for the line that is what? Farther from the origin, which is this guy, but still touches the visible region area. That point gives us the optimal solution. So for ISO profit, we are looking for introducing the line that is farther from the origin, which is zero. So I have one, another profit line. I can have another profit line. I can have another profit line, continue, but I can't go where my feasible region is. So you see that this particular ISO profit line touches on the region that is farther from the origin or the point farther from the origin, but still within what? The feasible solution area. That gives me my optimal solution. Okay, so that is it about, once I find this, then I can conclude that the firm should produce X1, they should produce 20, X2, they should produce what? 60. Then we can conclude that the optimal solution for this problem is that Giopetto should produce 20 soldier toys and 60 train toys. That will be your conclusion to achieve a total profit of what? 100 and what? 80, which is my optimal solution. I hope that is clear. My optimal solution is that the firm should produce 20 soldier toys and 60 um, train toys in order to achieve a total profit of what? 180 Ghana cities. So you may choose to stick with this or you use the ISO profit function line to find the optimal solution. All right. Then further, this is what we have here, just to uh, explain further. So the point G, that gives us the optimal solution. So the optimal solution will be one of the corner points of the common what area. 
if I'm using the isoprofit line Z, that is parallel and away from the origin for what? Maximization. If we maximize Z, our optimal solution is that let's produce 20 for soldier toys and 60 for train toys. Please, any question before I go to the next one? I'm taking my time for you. I know the problem with this whole Zoom. Yeah, Francis. Francis. Yeah. So why, so for the, why did you use zero, zero? Why did I use zero, zero? Yeah. This is one because, of, of the read points, please, so, this one. H. Okay. H. All right. So, so it is so also so a point I, within the feasible solution area. So, so what I want is also for like the admin minimization. And there's also zero for there's also zero for within that region. But do you have to use the zero zero? It means that you are not producing anything. That's it. But they want to produce something. Will you then advise that they should produce none in order to um, minimize cost? Zero zero, we I mean, ignore the zero zero. It's just one of the points I was explaining to you that you can also identify. But there is no way that you will say then advise them not to produce anything. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes, please. Sir, please, can you go over the ISO profit line? I have just finished the ISO profit line. Yes. Any question? I said for the ISO profit line, one will pick the objective function. Uh, I think it's two, where is the objective function? 3x1 plus 2x2. What we do is to assume an arbitrary value, okay? So that I can assume 50 into the profit function. 50 equals 3x1 plus 2x2. So I need a coordinate to plot the straight line. If x1 is zero, x2 will be 25. So let's say 0, 25. Then if x2, uh, is zero, x1 will be, uh, I think that should be give you like 50 divided by three, that's uh, 16 or 17, let's say 16.67 and zero. So I come and plot this, plot this coordinate. That is an arbitrary value I have assumed for the ISO profit. But if I introduce this, because it is maximization, it is although farther from the origin, but it doesn't touch the feasible solution area, that, those points. So I introduce another arbitrary value to compute another profit, ISO profit line. So I keep doing that till I get to the point that is the farthest. This is not farthest from the origin. This line is not farthest. This is the farthest. I can also have one somewhere here. But here, although it is farthest, you are out of the feasible region. So you are only looking for the ISO profit line farthest from the origin, but again, touches the feasible solution area. I hope that is clear. Any other question, my friends? Okay, I guess there is no, uh, Christopher. Sir. So please, can you please uh, assume a line that passes through the points of intersection of the, the two lines that touches the X axis and the Y axis? Yes, uh, we have how many lines? Three lines, okay? But there is a common region yes, that is known to all of them. That is why I kept insisting that, oh, I kept uh, suggesting that your region, the ISO profit line, though farthest from the origin, must still touch or it's within the feasible solution area. And our feasible solution area is on the lines all the way up here, here, this one, that one, this one, that one, this one. These are the feasible solution area. So I'm either within or I'm exactly at the, uh, on top of the lines. If that is what will give you the optimal solution, 
That is what you introduce. But the profit, you can assume any value to introduce into the graph and draw this accordingly. Any other question, please? Any other question? Okay, let's make progress if there is no question. So having said this, we need to understand after I have my X1 value and X2 value, we need to understand what we call binding and non-binding constraints. We define binding constraints. Typically, we are saying that binding constraints are constraints, okay? That we can find them on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side of the constraint. So that a resource is said to be binding. If all the resources allocated have been fully what, utilized. So binding constraints are constraints or they are resources that what is allocated is equal to what has been what utilized. How do you do that? Now that you have value for X1 and X2, now that you have value for X1 and X2, all you do, okay, I know my X1 value from the problem we calculated, X1 was what? Oh, let me look for it. X1 was 20, X2 was what? 60. So see here, and my first finishing constraint was what? 2X1 plus X2 was less than or equal to 100. Therefore, X1 was 2, 20, sorry. So 2 times 20 plus 60 here, this should give me what? 100. What is the amount allocated? 100. So it means that the left-hand side, this one, is equal to my right-hand side. Means that I have we have fully utilized the resources, that's labor, allocated to what? Finishing. Therefore, finishing constraint is a binding constraint where the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. Similarly, if I pick that for carpentry, I still introduce how many of soldier toys I'm producing, 20. We have X1 plus what? I think X2 less than or equal to 80. Finishing, sorry, soldier was 20. Capping, um, train was what, 60. This is 80 and this is also 80. So hours allocated for carpentry is also what, binding. So all I'm trying to say that if you are looking for binding and non-binding constraint in linear programming modeling, binding constraints are the constraints that the utilization, okay, is equal to what is available. That means that left-hand side equals to the right-hand side. The last constraint is not binding because this is 20 and it's not equal to what? 40. Means that demand constraint is non-binding. Please note that. All right. So we can pick another question for, uh, this is the same one. We are trying to, uh, I'm not going to teach you simplex method. So this one, this next slide, okay, when we talk about, let me clear all the drawing. If I'm talking about linear programming in standard form, okay, all we are saying that if I pick my maximization problem, my original maximization problem was for 3x1 plus 2x2, okay, we are introducing to you what is called the slack variable or slack resources, okay? So when a slack variable is introduced to the equation, we are just trying to, remember this one was saying less than or equal to, less than or equal to, less than or equal to. For maximization, S here is defined as the surplus, sorry, is defined as the slack variable, okay? So we said for standard form, requires that all constraints be in the form of what? 
qualities. A slack variable is added to a less than or equal to what? Constraint. To convert it into an equation. Then a slack variable typically represents an unused what? Resources. Please note that. Try actually to define what a slack variable is. We are looking for unused what? Resources. So remember when we're dealing with the binding constraints. If I have a non-binding constraint, the leftover is what I'll refer to as what? A slack variable. That is the unused resources. And again, a slack variable contributes nothing to the objective function. So here, because I have three main constraints, the number of slack variable you introduce will depend on the number of resource constraints you have formulated. So I have constraint one, constraint two, constraint three. Forget about the non-negativity. So I'm introducing three different constraints into the whole modeling that I have done. So X1 here is for slug variable one in the first equation. S2 here is a slug variable two in the second equation. Plus S3 here is equal to the slug variable three you have introduced into the equation. Because I have three constraints I've formulated. If you have four constraints, you have up to S4. If you have only two, you have up to S2. Then when I come to my objective function, the coefficient for slug variables are zero. That is why we made the statement. They contribute nothing to the objective function value. Of course, you have not, they are unused resources. So to what benefit does it uh, give to the objective what function? So you have 0s1 plus 0s2 plus 0s3 added to the original what uh, maximization uh, equation. And if I do this, I've only changed the whole model into a standard form. Uh, we would have used this whole thing to do what we call the simplex method of LP modeling. But this semester, I'm not going to teach simplex method. So you people, are, you've escaped the torture a bit. So I will leave the simplex method for maybe the next uh, semesters to come. All right, so let's make progress. We can also pick a problem for minimization since my friends will be asking, say, what about minimization? Okay, any questions so far? Any questions so far? Yeah. Yes, uh, please go ahead. Is there a reason why you added them? Three variables to the first inequality. Say that again. I think there's a reason why you, you added three slide variables, three mm -hmm. slide variables. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm asking there's a reason you choose three. Yes, and that's fine. That's what yes, yes. I just said that the number of constraints you have formulated will influence the number of slide variables you introduce into the equation. Yes, look. Uh, I don't know your name, mo.com. That is not a name. Guys, we keep telling you, use your name. We want to identify you by your name. After the class, please use proper name. Yes, Godfredo too. Uh, so please, I want to ask, um, for the um, the binding constraints, mm -hmm. I think for the one which was the non-binding, I think you realize that the X1 value was lesser than the resource, which was the 40. Yes, please. Um, will there ever be the possibility where and the variable, the decision variable value will be bigger than the resource. Can they be the like amount that? utilized? No, here we are looking at the uh, the resource utilized is more than what is allocated. Yes, okay. it is possible. It is possible because along a typical production line, sometimes you realize that the initial resource allocated, which we are using to produce the item. It's more than that. So new resources will be introduced. Okay, so I will find a question that I have to deal with that. So it's possible that can happen. Remember, we talk about greater than or equal to. 
okay? Greater than or equal to is also there. So we'll talk about that one as well. Uh, any last Thank questions? You. So we look at the... Uh, so let's look at a minimization problem, okay? A minimization problem. So two brands of fertilizers available. We have Super Grow and Quick Crop Quick. So field requires at least 16 pounds of nitrogen and 25 pounds of phosphate. Super Grow cost six bag. Quick Crop Quick also cost three bag. How much of each brand to minimize total cost of fertilizer given the following data? You are told that for super grow, you have this, you have nitrogen and you have what phosphate. So we will use two bags of what nitrogen for super grow and four bags of nitrogen for crop quick. Then we have four bags of what phosphate for super grow and three bags for what crop quick. Now, based on this information, like I said. We want to formulate a linear programming model. We define the decision variable. We define the objective function. We define the word constraints, then the non-negativity word constraint. So what are the decision variables here? Anyone can help us? What are the decision yeah, variables? <laughs> Please let me call you before you answer, okay? I want a decorum class. Uh, Cameron, Cameron. So, super grow and crop quick. Define it for me as a decision variable, not the name. Okay, so let's, mm -hmm. okay, so let's x1 mm -hmm. be the number of bags for super grow fertilizer. Okay. So, Perfect, perfect. What is the objective function here? What is the objective function here? When is the class ending? 3.30, right? 3.20, say. 3.20. your time near here, I was saying, I did not hear you. <laughs> Irama, please, what is the uh, objective function here? Yes, Irama or Comfort Usu, you can answer. Hello, sir. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is to minimize total cost of fertilizer. Exactly. Then the table, in fact, if you have tables in this form, it just simplifies the whole constraints that you are going to. We know the resources are nitrogen and phosphate. Okay, so let's watch here. Let X1 be bags of super grow to, then that's for quick pro. And we are saying minimization. So watch here, this is minimize Z. The question says that, a bag for super grow is six, and a bag for crop quick is three. So my minimization is what? Six X1 plus three X2. Then we, this is just to explain what we have done. My constraints are that out of the 16 um, allocated, where is the 16? Out of the 16, oh, I didn't write that. Okay, 16 for nitrogen pounds and 24 for phosphate. For nitrogen, two is allocated for super grow and four is allocated to that for crop quick. So you have, remember, it said uh, at least, at least, as we discussed, at least is what? Greater than or what? Equal to. So 2x1 plus 4x2 is greater than or equal to 16. Then again, 4x1 plus 3x2 is also greater than or equal to what? 24. Then the last non-negativity word constraint, x1, x2 
they are all greater than or equal to what? Zero. And again, because I have two decision variables, I can use a graph to solve the value for decision variable x1 and what? x2. So please watch here carefully. What you see here is that I take these two constraints. And again, I need a coordinate to formulate them. So when x1 is 0, x2 will be what? 4. Then when x2 is 0, x1 will be what? 8. So I plot this graph here, as you see here. Um, where is it? OK. Uh, 2 and 4, that is 16. So 0 and 4. Then 8 and 0, I draw my straight line. Please note, it is greater than or equal to. So the feasible solution for this straight line is on the line or above this line, greater than or equal to. Then this one also say, when x1 is 0, x2 will be what? 3 divided by, that's 8. Then when x2 is also 0, x1 will be what? 6. It's also greater than or equal to. So on this line, I'm looking at this region. Then my question is, this shaded portion become my feasible solution area, okay? But then we are looking for in this region. So from here, from here, let me draw this all the way here, all the way. Let me just use this to all the way at this point will represent my feasible solution area. Just as we did for the profit, remember we have a point here, we have another point here, we have another point here. So we could have technically, although these will be the possible solution, I have two, three main points I can use to estimate the values for X1 and X2. If that is clear, we can pick the point. This one is one. That means that x2, x1 is 0, x2 is 8. This one, uh, let's say this is 2 and what, 5. So x1 is 5, x2, x2 is 2. Then here, we have what, 8 and what, 0. So one of these three points will give me, for minimization problem, I'm looking for the point that gives me the minimal cost. Minimal cost. So this is what I have here, where is the minimal cost, means that I can pick those points, A, B, and what? C. B, as I said, will be five and two. C will be what? Eight and what? Zero. Then um, this guy, A will also give me zero and what? Eight. So I pick this first one, Substitute it into my objective function value. Whatever value I have, I put it there. So uh, I'll have what, 24. Then when I come here, I'm going to have 30 plus 6. So this is 36. This is for A, this is for B. And C, 80 times what, 0. No, sorry, 80 and... Uh, Six times eight, and that, that should give me what? 40 what? Eight. This is point C. So among these three, because it is minimization, I'm looking for the one that gives me the lowest profit. So point A is my reason of what? Interest. Means that I'm looking at not producing anything at all for uh, the, is it uh, nitrogen? No, super grow. So my optimal solution is that the firm should uh, bag or produce nothing for super grow and produce eight bags of crop what quick in order to minimize total cost value of what 24. What you can do further, I didn't say you can put all this into the equations that you have here. 
to see if it satisfy the values that you have here. So usually you say it's equal to, to satisfy that. Or we can also introduce what we call the ISO cost line, just like the ISO profit line. But here we are looking for a line, okay? That is what? Closer to the origin. Please note the opposite. Profit says farther to the origin. This one say closer to the origin, but still within the feasible solution area. So I'll be introducing ISO profit cost in this form till I get to one that touches what? That is getting closer to the origin, but still within the feasible solution area. That gives me my optimal solution. Then again, we can talk about surplus variable. Remember for maximization, we said slack variable. For minimization, we introduce the surplus what? Variable. And basically, surplus variable, as we said, they also contribute nothing to the value of the objective function. And they represent the excess above the constraints requirement. Remember, it was saying greater than or equal to. So if I find the utilized and that for the available, obviously the utilized will be more than what the available. So that is the excess and the excess is called the surplus variable. And then we can go further. If I want to also introduce standard form for this one, all I do is to subtract the surplus, unlike maximization where we add the slug variable. For minimization, we subtract the surplus variable from the equation to make it a standard form. Having said that, this is just a summary of the assumptions that we have used so far. I expect you to read that one. Then this is another problem for graphical method. Uh, you see, this is also minimization. Just the same assumption, we are able to solve this problem. So my good friends, this is how we deal with linear programming modeling and how to use linear programming modeling to find a decision variable. As I said, we have used what the graphical method approach. The next approach we are going to look at is to use the computer. If you have more than two decision variables, in fact, some of the using matrix can also be complicated, but thankfully we have computer and we have some applications that can facilitate and make the process very, very, very easy. So I'm going to introduce you to the computer solution. Basically, we are going to do data analysis. Okay, just a simple data analytics using an application called Solver. I'll be using it in Excel. So when I meet you on Monday, our next discussion will be using the computer solution. On that note, I'm going to pause here. If you have any question, please ask me so we can call it a day so that uh, your class rep, what is his name? You'll be happy that I've closed early today. So you can call Sir, please the no. class. David, you are very happy I'm going to close early, right? Say, say, say no, that's not true. Okay, so uh, question. Godfrey, please go on with your question. Okay, sir. So please um, ask me again the minimization um, issue. And I mm -hmm. think the resources, we have them to be at least, and so we have them to be the greater than or the equal to. Mm -hmm. so can we solve minimization issues? And just like the maximization issue, which was with the Less oh, yes, 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 yes. We, we can it have a mix like of... This way it's a, okay. We, we can it's have a mix it. of... For complex problems, we can have a maximization problem that has the less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, or the equal to itself. We can also have in between. Okay, so, yes, it's, it's always possible. But it's as I said, at your level here, I want to stick with what will not crack your brains or what will not kill you. Or some people, when they hear Quantidia, souls run out of their heart. But <laughs> stick with this site, okay? All right, Those of you will be doing MPhil. 
in operations management. You will meet me and we will deal with ourselves again. Yes, comfort. Comfort. Comfort, if you are not talking, uh, I think if you don't have any question, let me see if somebody has typed. Sir, please, is it because it's greater than or less than? That is why we are not using them. No, my friend, matrix. Somebody said this code is mad. Yo, thank you very much for calling me mad. Look, um, matrix can be used. We just equate everything and solve for the problem. So don't worry about because it's greater than or less than. That's why we are not using matrix. I said matrix is one form of methodology we can use to find a solution. Then another form is the graphical approach. Another form is the computer solution. Another methodology can be the, what do you call it? The uh, simplex method, okay? So you can go ahead and use matrix to solve this problem and you had the answer great so whichever methodology you use you should get the same answer thank you francis okay right. you have introduced like surplus and graph will, will you be asked to find the surpluses or you just in it in a, in no no i can ask you to but i've just defined what a surplus variable is and I've defined what a slug variable is. So I can ask you to compute a surplus variable and a slug word variable. Check the definition again, so that if you get a constraint, and I'm asking you to identify or compute the surplus variable and the slug variable, you should be able to do that. All right. Is it clear, Francis? Not, not really, but I'll go and sit down and Francis, read about it. Here. Francis, we've just explained this, that a slug variable is what? Represents unused resources. So if I have a non-binding constraint and I want to know the slug variable, what do I do? I just have yes. to calculate the unused variable. The difference between the utilized and the available, that gives you the unused what? Resources. For surplus, it's the same thing. If you use in excess, it is again the utilized minus what the available, and that gives you the surplus variable. Yes. So, say for example, when we have the twenty uh, less than forty, which is the non-binding. Mm -hmm. So, so is that the difference twenty? The twenty yeah. is your sub uh, black word. <laughs> Variable. Is uh, that okay? Yeah. Uh, last question so we can end the class. Uh, I'm a party. Then after that, Pell don't, don't do or whatever it is. I'm a go on. Yes, I'm a party. Please, when the tutorial class take us through this thing again. Uh, because uh, you are taking.